Believe it or not, I just had my first anniversary of being a YouTube content creator. I started YouTube on December 24th and today is December 27th. So I thought it would be great for me to recap my YouTube journey and talk about how much YouTube paid me in my first year of YouTubing. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jesse. I'm a first year cut flower farmer approaching my second and I decided to YouTube my cut flower farming journey on a whim in late December last year. I actually wasn't super sure what I was doing with my YouTube channel, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my strategy. But this is what we are going to cover in today's video. I want to talk a little bit about YouTube's monetization 101. So for those of you who don't know what it takes to get paid, I'll talk a little bit about that briefly. I want to talk about my strategy in terms of my approach to YouTube and how that's kind of actually shaped my strategy for cut flower farming as a whole. Then I want to talk about when I actually monetized, uh, how much did I make, and what videos did well, what surprises I had. I'm going to do a bit of an in-depth analysis to show you what kind of videos did well for me. And then I'm going to talk about why it's not just about the views. So going a little bit deeper into the analytics and the algorithm for YouTube. So let's get started. So let's start with YouTube 101 monetization. Now you might be under the impression that someone who uploads a viral video for the first time is going to get paid a lot of money. Unfortunately or fortunately, that is not the case. YouTube has two criteria that you need to meet in order to what they call monetize. You need to one, have at least 1,000 subscribers on your channel, and two, you need to have at least 4,000 watch hours within the last 365 days, which means you can qualify to monetize any time throughout the year. Now, once you hit these two thresholds, you then apply. So I hear that there's actually someone at YouTube who is reviewing these applications. It takes anywhere from like a couple of days to up to a month for you to get accepted. But once you get accepted, this is when you start making what they call ad revenue. And, and I'm going to break down what ad revenue looks like and how it might actually fluctuate between different types of genres of videos. But all you have to understand is that in order to become someone who's being paid at creating YouTube content, you have to be consistent in order to achieve those two criteria. And you have to put up quality content, right? There are people who have been YouTubing for years and have never hit this criteria because they're not putting out content that is really relevant or sticky enough for someone to come back consistently to get this 4,000 hours. Now, this can take anywhere. I've seen people monetize literally within a couple of months. I've seen, as I was saying, people monetize within years. And I'm going to talk about how long it took for me to monetize. But first, let's talk about my strategies. So why did I even get into YouTube? Well, if we take a step back, I was actually consuming copious amounts of YouTube flower content back in 2020. And I was consuming this content not because I had any desire to ever start a cut flower farm. At the time, we had actually just moved into our townhouse and we were planning on being in that townhouse for at least another, I don't know, like three to four years minimum and had no plans to move. But I was gardening. I was having, you know, vegetable container gardens and I quickly got into comp companion planting with flowers. So that is how I discovered YouTubers like Nicole from Flower Hill Farm. I discovered Serena and Ian from You Can't Eat the Grass. And I got hooked. I mean, I got hooked on their content to follow them on a consistent basis. You know, I was always really excited to see a new video from Serena and Ian. And then, you know, just as, as you keep on watching the, these videos, the, the algorithm is going to feed you more videos. So that's how I learned about flowers. That's how I learned about flower farming. Um, it was just very passive consumption of YouTube. And, you know, sometimes I would employ some of those things into my personal garden. I'll be honest, it's very hard to do um, a certain level of companion planting in containers. But obviously, you know, I still got the concept, right? So I kind of used that time as my classroom, as Jess from Roots and Refuge would say. I used this off time where I wasn't necessarily doing a lot of work to just learn and observe. 
So that's how one day I saw a video from Serena and Ian talking about how much money they made on YouTube. And this took them lots of years. You know, one of the things that they were trying to really convey was that it is not passive income on YouTube because you have to be able to consistently put up videos in order to get paid. If you have a slump, if you stop putting up videos, the algorithm will punish you for that. But that being said, you know, they made over $50,000 that year YouTubing. Again, it took them years to get to that state, but it made me realize that, hey, if I ever have something worth YouTubing about, I should actually consider it as a viable option. And, you know, I'm someone who has done a couple of other things. I've had a food blog before. I have the side hustle, an e-commerce company, which I am now winding down. But I've done a bunch of things online to kind of understand how advertising works and what people pay for those advertising spaces. And I was just shocked at how much YouTube in terms of video content paid versus something like writing a blog and getting revenue off of what we call banner or display ads. So anyway, we got to a state where um, I wanted to start a flower farm and it, it it's a longer story than just that, but we wanted to start a flower farm and I thought, hey, you know, one of the things that I've been realizing as a gap is this business side of things. Now, there are lots of content out there from a variety of growers around, how do I start seeds? How do I grow this? How do I grow that, right? It's a lot of the content is really focused on the growing aspect of things, which is content that I honestly need because I am a relatively new grower in the grand scheme. I mean, there are people who start flower farms who have like a decade's worth of growing experience, I started gardening basically in 2019 and that was like half gardening because I bought a couple of herbs. So I really started full on gardening in 2020, had a little bit more experience in 2021. And 2022, when I broke ground for flower farming was really the first year I was not container gardening. So all of that content was extremely useful for me, but I noticed that there wasn't content on stuff that I was also interested in around, hey, like, is there a little bit more transparency around the numbers? How much profitability did you make off of this specific event versus having like a one year look back, which is a more common type of video, but that video happens once a year. And I just had other business related questions. So I thought, hey, if I have these questions, then other people might have these questions too. And that is how I got the idea for YouTubing the business side of things to cover a very, very specific niche that even though there's not a ton of people who are interested in it in the grand scheme, I mean, I'm not producing videos on like financial advice or cooking where like half the population is interested, right? I'm focusing on a very, very specific part of the population. And sometimes that's what you need to do in order to do well, right? So. We'll see how that goes. But anyway, a couple of criteria for me personally when I was starting up my YouTube channel. One, I did not want high startup costs. Now, all of my videos are filmed on an iPhone for this year. I don't have a mic. You could probably hear the wind. Um, and I fortunately did not need to buy any editing software because Eric had it from, um, we, he, he, he did a lot of food content before, so he had something called Filmora, which is what I edit on. And that was only like, I think like a 50 or $60 purchase and he had it, right? And of course we have computers, so I did not need to buy anything extra. The only input I needed to put in was my time. So that became my second criteria was I did not want to get burnt out YouTubing. You can spend hours upon hours editing, filming, my criteria was I needed to be efficient. I wanted videos where I did not need a second person filming. I wanted them to be, I mean, you can see the style of my videos. They're typically monologues. I prop my phone on top of something. In this case, it's actually two labels um, to make it high enough. And then I talk into the camera and then I import it into Filmora. I edit it. And so for a typical 30 minute video, you know, it'll take at least 30 minutes to film. Um, in this case, uh, I actually filmed yesterday. The lighting was so bad that I was like, I'm just going to wait for the daylight to refilm. Um, that often does not happen. But so let's just say filming takes 
about 45 minutes for a 30 minute video. And then I'm gonna edit it. So another 45 minutes. So that brings me to an hour and a half. And then I have to upload it, export it, all that good stuff. So, you know, all in all, you know, you're talking about maybe two hours for a 30 minute video. And I wanted to keep it in that range, right? Because I preach this on my other videos, but time is money when it comes to harvesting and everything else. Same thing for YouTube. So for me, um, that meant realistically making one video a week at the most. And what ended up happening was in certain months at the height of harvest, I made one video every other week. And that video was centered around how I did at my market and breaking down the numbers after a market. But all in all, you know, that was, um, for me, that was consistency, right? I was putting out videos at least a few times a month. I would say on average, I did three to four videos a month. And I wanted to make sure that those videos were quality over quantity, right? I wanted to make sure that I had something useful to talk about and that people would get value out of these videos. All right, so now the moment that you've been waiting for, how much money did I make or did YouTube pay me this year? So I made around $630 and counting since there's still a couple of days left in December, but $630 for the year. Now let's put this into perspective in terms of when I started monetizing because I obviously did not start monetizing on in, in the beginning of January, right? So I met those two criteria, the 1,000 sub subscribers and 4,000 hours sometime in late May. I applied and they were relatively quick in getting back to me and accepting me. So on July 1st on the dot, which makes it easier for record keeping purposes, I started seeing ad revenue come in. It was like a switch just turned on. So that meant that I've made $630 within a six month period. And that is way above actually what I thought I would be making at this time. I was expecting maybe a couple hundred dollars. And, you know, at the end of the day, $630, even if you double it to, to reflect the full year, we'll call it $1,200, um, you know, is, is not anything that's going to make me like change my future plans, quit my job, but it is a decent amount of money. It would have paid for a good amount of my bulb order. It's just, it's good to have this separate flow of income come in, especially to supplement um, some of the huge upfront costs I had in terms of starting a flower farm for my first year. Now let's break down what that $630 comprised of in terms of work. Um, it, from an hourly perspective, it was not a very good breakdown. But again, you know, half of my videos did not really earn revenue until June. So it's a bit skewed in that sense. And it's kind of like a snowball effect, right? Where once you start gaining a certain level of subscribers, um, YouTube is going to help prioritize your algorithm to people who they think is going to like your content based off of people who liked your content before, right? So things do start building and have momentum. So this year I made, um, including this video that I will upload, 79 videos. So they averaged a total of 1,400 views per video. Um, some of those videos are skewed by um, higher view videos. So I think my highest viewed videos is almost around 5,000 views. And my lowest viewed videos is a few hundred views. So, um, so yeah, so 1400 views on average, I'm pretty happy with that. And I would say that typically my videos reach about that 1000 threshold mark within three weeks or so. And then, you know, when you think about that monthly revenue, what that looks like, it's anywhere from about $68, $68 a month to the highest of $116 a month. And that high of $116 a month was in July where I posted more videos. Um, and then the lowest month was actually surprisingly this month month in this or yeah it was this month in December which I'll talk a little bit more about in terms of just why why but um I want to talk a little bit about what videos actually did well for me now one of the things that I benefited from was Serena and Ian's video I think this is last year where they talked about how 
they significantly saw an increase in interest in their videos when they videoed about their markets. So soup to nuts, starting from harvesting, making their bouquets, selling at the farmer's market, talking about how much money they made. Um, I love those videos personally. And the only thing that was missing for me was then breaking down, okay, like let's say you made $1,000 at a market, what were your inputs to get there and what was the true profit? So that's what I incorporated into my videos. And I try to also be intentional for myself around a particular objective I wanted to have in in making bouquets for that market, right? So my best video was actually um, something called Market Sellout, how I priced my bouquets and calculated their cost for profitability. This was a market where I had a lot of flowers. I wanted to say to myself, hey, like how many stems am I putting in a bouquet? Am I pricing this bouquet adequately? And so I put all that into video. This is actually a relatively longer video. And this one is the one that got nearly 5,000 views and it got me $65 to date of revenue. Now that video will continue earning money assuming that people find that content relevant. So next best video was color theory, harvesting and making bouquets. How much money did I make at this week's market? So the intention for that week was to try to play around with color and see if people gravitated towards a certain color scheme for the bouquets at the market. And that one got me 3,500 views, $42 total. I'm going to go through my next three to give you my top five so that you get an idea of how much money these videos have made. Um, from Harvest to Bouquet to Total Market Flop, that one had 2,700 views, $36 total. Um, local Marketing, how I cleared 55 bouquets on Facebook Marketplace, 3,200 views, $35 in revenue. And the last one was Building Fast Bouquets, 18 in 50 minutes, how I decided whether to sell $15 or $20 bouquets at my market, 2,800 views and that got me $34. One thing to also note is that longer videos do tend to do better in ad revenue because you have more opportunities to place ads. YouTube introduced introduce something called mid-roll ads. I think this is like a year and a half ago or two years ago, but typically what you'll see is when you view a video on YouTube, you'll get an ad in the beginning and that is pretty standard. But if the video is, I believe, above 10 minutes, it qualifies for something called mid-roll, which is basically ads in the middle of the video. There are certain ways that you can implement this. You can manually put it in or you can set it on auto, which is what I do. And so what YouTube's machines do is they scan your video, they look for natural breaks and they put in an ad whenever they feel like there's a natural break because you obviously don't want to disrupt someone watching an exciting part of a video and then put in an ad and then have them lose their attention, right? Um, it's not good for the content creator and it's also not good for the advertiser because then the viewer gets pissed off. So I set it at auto and sometimes in a video I'll have like zero uh, mid rolls and sometimes they'll put an eight um, and eight is a little bit too excessive ex um, even for a 60 minute video in my view the industry standard I believe is every five to six minutes if you're streaming on something like an ABC or Hulu you'll actually get fed an ad so um, I, I I hate watching videos like that so what I'll do is after my video has been up for like at least 48 hours I'll go back in I'll check to see how many mid roll ads there are and if I see ads getting placed like at minute two I'll take that out if I see them being spaced too closely together I'll take them out right so this is why sometimes when you watch my videos in the beginning there actually might be a few more ads in the middle than if you were to watch it again later on um, and it's because I'm letting YouTube do its work first and then I'm going to take out the ads to make it a better viewing experience all right so let's talk about some surprises um, there are some videos that did better than I thought um, the other gap that I noticed when I wanted to YouTube or when I was looking for content on YouTube is that even though there's a lot of growing information out there, either it is not categorized well for us to be able to search for that information or there is just no information on it. So for example, when I was moving from my townhouse to this place now, I wanted to grow ranunculus. I want to grow in crates and I want to see other people's experiences of growing ranunculus in crates and I couldn't find anything on it. Same thing with stock. Um, I found a lot of literature online, but not a lot of YouTube videos on growing stock, especially in my climate. So what did I do? I made videos on them and 
both of them did pretty well. So for example, the stock one, um, I had a video that I uploaded around just why you should be starting stock earlier than you think. I think this was uploaded sometime in February. So very far beginning in my journey, I uploaded this video. It's gotten 3,700 views. It's made me $8.50. Um, it's only made $8.50 because it, it was uploaded per, at a time when I was not monetizing yet. So the majority of the views happened then. But that video is still making me money right now because for whatever reason, it is relevant to people. So one of the takeaways for you, especially if you're someone who is thinking about YouTubing, is focus on what they call the long tail. So the long tail is basically all of these um, keywords or searches that may not be popular for everyone. So if you think about a bell curve, right, the top of the bell is what is most popular and just um, on average higher frequency. But when you get to long tail, there might be fewer people who want to look for it or search for it, but over time, um, they, they add up to a lot of searches and people, right? And so I think that focusing on something like stock is a long tail play. So you're not going to see a lot of views in the beginning, but you will continue to see views throughout. And I think it's important to have a balance of videos that are appropriate for a very specific time of year, but also videos that are what they call more evergreen, which is applicable anytime throughout the year and will continue getting you views. So, um, Another surprise here was my Snapdragon video did well. There's plenty of videos on Snapdragons out there, but there weren't a lot of videos talking about the different groups. So I talked about that as well as my experiences. I always try when I do videos on varieties to give you a bit more of a, what I call a bird's eye view. So it's not just like plant Snapdragons with me, right? It's plant Snapdragons with me. Let me show you how they've grown over a certain um, few weeks and let me tell you what I did wrong or what I did right, that kind of stuff, right? Like there needs to be some kind of intent versus you just watching me planting. Like that's also another one of my criterias. So the next part I'm gonna get into is why it's not just about views. For some of you, this may not be as interesting for someone who is into business analytics and just wants to understand a little bit more of the why behind marketing. This is really interesting for me, but I wanna talk about, or I wanna start getting into some terminology that you may not be familiar with. So YouTube at the end of the day pays its content creators 55% of what the advertiser pays. Now let's just say for ease, um, an advertiser is willing to pay a hundred dollars uh, to reach 1000 people or 1000 eyeballs. We call that cost per mile. I don't know why it's called mile, but the mile is basically a thousand. So cost per thousand, uh, they're willing to pay a hundred dollars. And so YouTube would take $45 of that and give you $55 of that for the con as a content creator. Um, it's actually, you know, a pretty generous amount, I think, um, given all the work that YouTube also needs to do. In any case, so in the industry, there are CPM, cost per mile, is a very common terminology. We talk about CPM when it comes to what is the cost that an advertiser needs to pay to put an ad on a video versus for a banner versus for whatever else it is, right? And I'll tell you definitely that the cost to put an ad on any video content is going to be significantly more than the cost of a banner ad. And when I say banner ad, I mean, if you're scrolling through, let's say like the New York Times, Pop Sugar, whatever website, and you start seeing like a ad um, that, that looks like a banner, that is what we call display or banner. And typically, you know, that is a fraction of the cost of a video ad, which drives more engagement. Um, obviously it's a video, so you can put a little bit more content than something that is typically static, or if it's not static in a banner, it's, you know, just, it, it's kind of like a GIF dynamic type of thing, right? So any case, uh, CPM is a relatively uh, well-used terminology in the marketing world. YouTube introduces something called revenue per mile. So the cost per mile is what the advertiser is willing to pay. The revenue per mile is what you as a content creator would get from YouTube. So that is taking out that 45% cut that YouTube has as well as some other stuff. So revenue per mile RPM is something that I as a content creator am more interested in looking in. And this is the metric that I'm going to use to talk about why it's not just about the views. So. Let's talk about my videos with the highest revenue per miles because not all videos have the same RPM. So my top video 
with the highest RPM was actually one of my lowest viewed videos. It is about costs, fixed variable opportunity considerations to maximize profit. That one only got 718 views, but the cost or the revenue per mile was $19.77, which meant I made $14 off of that video. Um, and a thousand people didn't even view that video, right? Next video that had the highest RPM was, do I need an LLC and EIN beginner cut flower questions? 710 views. Again, also got me $14 because RPM was $18.32. The third video with the highest RPM was $16.67. And that was around, can tulips be profitable? What you should pay per bulb and charge for, by STEM. That one had 1,500 views um, and that one got me $25. So you're probably asking, well, what was your RPM for the other videos that you mentioned earlier that got all those views? Well, the video that got the highest amount of views that was close to $5,000, the one about my market sellout and how I priced my bouquets, that RPM was $13.12. So the difference between $13 and $19 for my highest RPM video is about $6 in difference, right? I had um, we'll call it four times as many views, right? So four times six is $24. So if this video had that highest RPM, I would have made over $100 on this video by now. Now, the difference of $40 right now is really not that significant, but if you were to scale this to tens of thousands of views, hundreds of thousands of views, now it really does start making a difference. Um, that second highest view video around color theory, which was 3,500 people, that RPM was $12.42. So you're starting to get an idea. And my RPMs will go anywhere from as low as like $3 a video to that $19. So what changes the RPM for a video? And it's really the content that you're choosing to focus on. So for example, if you are posting videos around financial advice, you are going to do very well as a YouTube content creator because the types of advertisers who want to target that type of viewer are willing to pay money. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So, you know, I, I consume some financial content videos and when you pay attention to some of the ads on there, like I've seen financial advisory ads on there. So it might cost a lot of money for them to acquire a customer. Let's just say that they're willing to pay you $50 um, per 1000 people. Uh, if they just get one customer, that customer is going to spend a lot of money with them. So therefore their return on investment is a lot higher and therefore they can, how do you say, take the risk of paying more for a lead because once that lead converts, they make a lot more money. Now contrast that to some of the stuff that, you know, m m my videos get like the other day I saw Hobby Lobby ad, right? Now Hobby Lobby, this is what we probably call like just a reminder ad reminding you to go into Hobby Lobby during the holidays. I'm betting you they're not paying $50 <laughs> for a thousand views, right? Because even if they get someone at their store, um, you know, they're, they're not spending as much money as like a couple thousand dollars with a financial advisor. So, so you get the point here. And that basically means that the need in which you choose to YouTube as a content creator will dictate how much money you ultimately make. So if you're looking to get into YouTube to make money, um, you know, things that I would stay away from are gaming, um, even children's videos, because there's a lot of restrictions on the number of ads and the types of ads you can put into children's videos. That being said, I know that Coco Melon is one of the the most successful children's uh, content uh, creation videos out there, um, but they also have billions of views, right? So you have to put that into perspective. Now, my highest RPM videos were videos that were focusing on profit and business related videos. And that makes sense, especially in the context of what I just said, right? When I look at some of those videos, I have things like Experian that is showing up. I have Squarespace advertising on there. So you can get an idea for how much a video is potentially making by observing what content is on there and even the types of ads that you're getting, right? So if you're gonna watch flower content Content and you're going to watch like something like car videos, like my husband, you're, you should be getting different ads um, because they should be using the context of what the video is to inform what ads to serve you. Now, I talked a little bit about 
just why or I mentioned that December was my lowest month and the reason was because the RPM was about 20% lower than other months. I have no idea why December had the lowest RPMs because December is typically the most expensive time for any advertiser to advertise because it is the holidays. Everyone wants to advertise. Everyone wants to compete for the dollars out of the consumer's pocket. And therefore there is more demand than supply of the number of places you could put your ads or what we call inventory. So the fact that RPM was lower was just, I mean, I'm still trying to figure that out. So um, when I figure that out, I'll let you guys know. Um, but yeah, so it, it is what it is, right? You know, I cannot control RPM. I, the only way I can control it is the type of content that I put out. And that actually takes me to the next part in terms of what I want to talk about, which is what does this mean for next year? So not much. It really doesn't change much of what I'm going to YouTube about, um, how consistently I YouTube. I plan on really doing the same thing, except one thing I do want to improve is my editing, getting a mic, and potentially using that DSLR that I actually have sitting somewhere in the back because now I've proven that YouTube is worth investing a little bit more time and money in. But from a content perspective, you know, I started YouTubing knowing a lot of just what drives the algorithm, what drives the, the pricing of RPM, CPM, I work in marketing after all. Um, and the other thing is like, I do love making educational content around the business side of things. Um, I am the type of person who chooses to read business related nonfiction books in my personal time, right? So all of this stuff is totally up my alley and I love the interaction that I get in the comments around the business side of things. So one thing to note is that I have never started flower farming intending to quit my day job. I get a lot of fulfillment out of my day job. My day job challenges me and I live in America. I am the benefits provider of my family. So um, having benefits is very important in America, right? But all that to say, you know, starting a flower farm was always a side hustle that was meant to satisfy a creativity and curiosity side of me. Um, I've enjoyed being outdoors. I've enjoyed going back to roots in terms of what our ancestors did. It's given me a much better appreciation for my day job where if it's blizzarding outside or if it's 100 degrees outside, I am still in a temperature controlled environment sitting on my butt in front of a computer, not exerting any energy. And I would say that the type of stress that I get at my day job is incomparable to the stresses that farmers have, which are typically completely out of their control, right? So, you know, I went into flower farming understanding all of this um, and I have no intent to quit my day job. And so what that means is how I choose to spend my time flower farming and YouTubing is actually gonna look a little bit different than someone who is looking to really build up their flower farming business to be able to quit their day job, right? And I say this because at the end of the day, you know, my day job comes first. So when I think about how I spend my time, it's around how do I, how do I maximize getting what I want out of it, but also making money, right? So it's not always about the money, but um, I'm not going to operate this business at a loss. And unfortunately, you know, unless if you're going to do like wedding events and workshops and all that stuff, the money is not in selling flowers. Um, you have to do a really high volume of selling to florists, to like directly to consumer doing CSAs in order for you to make money. So for me at my scale, the money in flower farming is either in YouTube or it's in content that I am creating for other flower farmers. And this is the other piece that I wanna to touch upon because when I went to flower farming and started YouTubing, I was just thinking that my end customer is that customer who's buying a bouquet for me, right? And that could be that person who comes from the market, the person who's on marketplace or the florist. But my true customer is actually not that person. My true customer within the first two months of YouTube being, became very clear to me is you is the person who consumes my YouTube content, who is likely another fellow flower farmer who is in their beginning years. So I really hone in my target to, hey, my 
my target customer is that first to third year cut flower farmer who is in a similar part of my journey and who is interested in seeing what I'm doing or more interested in the business aspect of things that they may not have considered. So what does this mean? It means that I completely rehauled how I thought about using my Instagram. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll notice that I have pretty photos of flowers once in a while, but it's not always pretty photos because the content is really catered towards a fellow flower farmer. And the content that I'm posting is more around just things that I'm thinking about related to everyday business. So for example, my latest post was actually about me and how I feel mentally better about recognizing revenue closer to the time of sale and why CSAs for me right now, given where I am, in my flower farming business just, you know, doesn't make sense to me, right? So I talk about things that I think are relevant for other flower farmers, and they're typically a little bit more detailed or photos um, that supplement some of the YouTube content that I create. So for me, you know, my, my, my YouTube helps gets me followers on Instagram and I use both of those platforms to complement each other. But I am now starting to build out my Facebook page to be more oriented to that direct to consumer customer because that's where a lot of them are in terms of if I want to sell flowers and I don't have an outlet for them, I'll post on Facebook. So even thinking about, you know, how your audiences might different differ between the different platforms is something really important for you to think about. And, you know, for me, the the ability to have a very specific type of audience on both YouTube and Instagram is important because even though right now I might not be doing much in the future, if I want to create more content, if I want to um, just create like digital products, right? I have a pool of people who might also be interested in that stuff versus me needing to go out and do marketing. I mean, there are a lot of people who their sole customer is that flower farmer and you'll know it because they try to sell stuff to you. So one of the things that's really come to my advantage this year is I had a lot of extra quorms um, that I wanted to get rid of because I wanted to buy them in wholesale prices, but I didn't need 2,500 ranunculus quorms, right? So I sold quite a few quorms off of both YouTube and Instagram because of the following that I built up. I also sold quite a bit of tulip bulbs that I didn't need, right? So those are all things that I had not anticipated that YouTube would help me with. But, you know, when the opportunity arises and you're trying to figure out, hey, how do I get rid of some stuff? You know, this stuff all starts coming together for you. So in any case, I'm pretty happy with where I am my first year of YouTube. I am really grateful to all of you for continuing to follow, for subscribing, for engaging with me. Um, for, for me, I get a lot out of YouTube and I hope that you get a lot out of my videos too. And you know, if you're someone who's looking to create content, I would really encourage you to just try. I mean, you know, you probably have a smartphone, you probably have a computer. The only thing that you might need is some editing software. There's a bunch of free resources out there on how to do it. So don't let any of that prevent you from doing it. And if you're not interested in creating content, hopefully this was interesting for you just to understand what it's like to be a content creator and the amount of work that a lot of those people put into videos, but also the rewards that they get, right? So drop me a comment if you have any questions or if you want to comment on something and I'll see you next time.